At the end of this month, I'll be heading to uh, Papua New Guinea for my first overseas uh, missions trip. So I've put off this year traveling overseas till mid-year. Um, and I'll be also going to the Philippines in October and uh, mainly meeting with pastors and leaders and sharing with them. And there's other trips to Africa and Europe as well. But uh, uh, keep Jono in your prayers. That is not the safest place in the world, but uh, he's a man of faith and vision and boldness and, uh, and lots of people come to Christ. So we're very uh, proud of uh, uh, John o. Osborne and what he's doing in, in Christ there in northern Uganda. And we're also very proud of uh, Tim and Nikki Lockins and, and um, Dan and Serenity uh, Pizalak, who's assisting him. And the team is 60 men, women and children that are now said yes to CFC South, which is great. So half of them are kids. And uh, we reckon by, uh, by mid-August, we're thinking about probably late August, early September, when we kick off officially, publicly, uh, we could have well over 100 people starting. So, uh, so keep Tim and Nikki in your prayers. It's a very exciting time. And, and people who don't know Jesus are coming to these meetings. So they meet today. They're having, it's a pre-launch meeting, but it's a service. And they're advertising uh, personally. And then the other fortnight, they meet as, as a leadership team. And they've got small groups operating down south. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, what's taking place and I, I reckon after we launch by the end of the year we could see that double to a couple of hundred people so it's going to be our I believe our, our largest church plant and uh, so just keep them in your prayers uh, they're, they're out of sight but they're not out of mind so uh, we're very thrilled about that um, we're, we're doing a series entitled Life Hacks and uh, the, there are keys there are truths that we want to uncover uh, about life and liberty and freedom in Christ, taking the story of King David. And uh, I, I was checking out my resources and file on how many messages I've done on David over the years, and I counted 14. So I spent uh, a day, half a day, reading all my messages, and I got inspired. I thought, there's another book there. So, <laughs> so it was, uh, so I thought, uh, so I had that thought, but uh, he is an amazing character. And so we're doing five messages, and I'm doing a couple, and uh, Pastor Nathan Cass and, and Sam uh, are doing the other three. But uh, today I want to focus on understanding our origins and understanding what has made us and perhaps why we do what we do and how only through Christ can we get free of some of the negative factors in relation to our family of origin or things that have happened to us. And, and we all need to guard against being defined solely by our family of origin um, or by the situational curved balls that can come our way in life. And so sometimes a ball comes and you've got to catch it. <laughs> I didn't want to catch that, but it came your way and it's out of your control and it's not because of you, but it's happened. Stuff happens in life. It really does. Um, and so I want to share with you about King David and his family of origin issues today to demonstrate how circumstances can influence us and even derail us before we even get started in life. However, the more aware we become of those factors and the more open we are to Jesus in our midst, then the Lord can change us and shape our lives and we don't have to be dictated to and controlled by what's happened in our past or by, you know, we don't have to carry those curved balls. We can actually drop them and replace them. And Jesus is the best replacement medicine. And when he comes into your life, everything changes. Um, and so we may never forget, but we're not controlled by by things that are untoward that have happened to us, no, no fault of our own. That's the reason why I wrote uh, The Me I Can Be. And um, I just, we just published the, the Church We Can Be, and many of you have, uh, have uh, purchased that about my 40 years, things that I've learned in the life of the church. Uh, but this one here is, uh, the best part of this is not what I wrote, but the seven testimonies that are there. And I've put my testimony, Kathy's put hers, and, 
and uh, stories of life, brokenness, curveballs, dysfunction, child abuse, uh, all kinds of you know, mental illness, demonization, uh, a whole pile of life issues that uh, people that I know and love, and, uh, and the reason why I've selected them is I've known them for like 30, 40 years, and they're not going to backslide on me. We offer to publish a book, then they realise the person's no longer walking with Jesus and you've got to pulp everything. Um, so, uh, but they're wonderful stories, and they're stories of hope. And if you haven't, there's only a thin book, 100 pages, though, and, and Pastor Jill Steele has done an excellent study guide. In fact, Jill's using this for our leadership development group. She's done two nights of just processing about how we can change and not be controlled by whatever's happened in our past. So if you haven't purchased it, get hold of it and, uh, and, and work your way through it. It's an easy read, but it has some pretty profound implications and practical helps on how to... To, to grow, and, and Jill's study guide is excellent on that. So King David was a man who had many triumphs and many tragedies. <laughs> um, he was uniquely gifted, but he was very human at the core of his being. Uh, he was so strong in battle, ferocious, unbeatable, an amazing general, an amazing soldier, fearless, bold. He's like, the, like Alexander the Great was, if you know how bold he was as a young man and as a, as a soldier king uh, out the front in, in the battle. Well, King David was like that uh, as, a young, as a young ruler. And, um, but yet he was so weak in his home. His contrast. And uh, amazing, amazingly skilled, amazing abilities how he could tap into the grace and power of God. And yet, the shadow of Jesse, his dad, and, uh, and his mum, and his brothers, and the influence of his home affected him. And so, he's not the best role model regarding being a husband. So, fellas, don't look to David to guide you in how to handle your many wives. <laughs> don't look to him, parents, as a guide on how to lovingly discipline your children. He just couldn't do it and didn't do it. And, uh, and I can tell you, all of you here are better parents than King David. So let's be realistic about him. And in some areas of his life, that shadow showed itself in his life and also in his children's lives. And yet, I, I, you look at that and you think, how can someone... Who, who draws so close to God can also yield to the dark side at times. And, uh, but you've got to understand the culture, the society, and the kind of dysfunction, dysfunctional family he came from. The, the question I have is, if God didn't call him and God's grace come into his life, what kind of person would have he been? And so we're, we're thankful that he got saved. We're thankful that, that he he connected with God and that God called him and filled him with the spirit because uh, without the Lord, I don't know, uh, he could have been a, a terribly diabolical person that wreaked a lot of evil in our world because of, of uh, the breaking of his life, the, the dysfunction, but God was merciful to him. And um, why have millions of people, hundreds of millions of people over the past 3,000 years been so inspired by his story and by the Psalms that he wrote. He didn't write all 150, but let's say at least 100 of them he wrote. Um, beautiful songs, wonderful poetry. Why do people live in those Psalms? What, why are some of those Psalms the ones that, that people have found amazing hope in God and, and help for today and hope for tomorrow and comfort and strength. It, it's, we, we, we're drawn to them um, because he's such a role model of what real and genuine devotion to God looks like. There's no, nothing plastic about David. He lets it all hang out. In fact, sometimes when he's talking to God at his prayers, you get a bit embarrassed. Go, man, you're talking to God here, mate. But he just lets it all hang out, exactly what he's feeling, what he's going through. Um, and, but his devotion is beautiful. In spite of his imperfections and his very real failings, there's more information on, on David than any other character in the Old Testament, including Moses. 
We really see his heart and his mind coming through all of his successes and also all of his failures. And what's more, we get great insights into the nature of what God our Heavenly Father is like. He's really like a New Testament man in the Old Testament era. You can grab some of the Psalms and you can link them in with some of Paul's letters. His understanding of grace, his understanding of mercy, his understanding of the gift of the Spirit, of forgiveness, of, of repentance, of, uh, uh, he, he's pretty amazing actually. So his understanding of, of God rescuing him and helping him in, in the affairs of life and particularly when he crashed and burned and he did and he crashed and burned a couple of times so um, to understand David's story you've got to understand a bit about the culture children growing up a thousand years before Christ in, in Middle Eastern culture Hebrew culture, Mesopotamian culture um, the fathers and mothers of that era from our understanding from scripture and also from history uh, really didn't bond with their children. There was very little bonding and very little discipline. And so, uh, and it had catastrophic effects upon, upon children, and it still does today, where there isn't loving discipline. And I don't mean when I say discipline, grabbing a stick and whacking a kid. I'm not talking about physical corporal punishment. And so David grew up in a family where there was no loving discipline, no proper correction, no boundaries. And there seemed to be no bonding between father, mother, and, uh, and, and, and the boy, and even with his seven older brothers. Um, and as I said, you know, it had catastrophic effects on his life and also on the lives of his children later on. Um, but for God's call and grace and power, uh, I think David would have been totally destroyed from what we can see. You see, the two great leaders that David had around him um, before he became king was uh, Eli, the high priest, and Samuel, the last judge, the first prophet, who inaugurated the monarchy with King Saul, and then David became the second one. And both Eli and Samuel, their sons, ran them up. They, they were not good fathers. They were not good role models. You can read that in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 1 Samuel chapter 8. In fact, the whole book of Samuel and 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, the first uh, uh, eight, ver eight chapters are all about about Samuel and Eli and then about King Saul and then from chapter 15 it's all about King David and right through to 2 Samuel fantastic fantastic books and um, and so both Eli and, and Samuel their sons um, became corrupt terribly corrupt and they gave themselves over to, to self-indulgence and evil and it seems like David's father Jesse from what I can read from the text and, I, and I've reflected on this a lot and and uh, looked at the Psalms, why David wrote what he wrote at times. Um, it would seem that David's father, Jesse, ignored him. I think that's just cr terribly cruel for a child to be ignored by his dad, that he's not even noticed. I think more than that, he was disrespected uh, by his dad and, and by the, the seven other boys. Who knows why? Maybe David was just different, just a different kid. Just different. He's different. She's different. <laughs> Um, God makes us all different. Maybe he was a loner. It seems like he enjoyed time just being on his own. And uh, he was a country boy and he loved being with sheep. And, uh, and, and also he was very sensitive, very sensitive and loved the arts. So he developed a skill in, in, in playing music. Uh, so skillful did he become there on his own that the palace found out about his ability to play, and this is before King Saul knew that he was going to be the anointed king, to come and play for him when he was terribly depressed. And so uh, David spent a lot of time on his own, in his own thoughts. And so maybe that's why um, uh, the father disrespected him, because he was so different and, uh, and was just an unusual child, very sensitive with an artistic flair. Now, the background, before I read the scripture to you, is that Samuel, who is the last judge, if you read the period of the judges, then one Samuel, he crosses over between being a judge like Samson and Gideon and being a prophet. And God used Samuel. Samuel's a towering figure in the Old Testament. God used Samuel to inaugurate the monarchy. 
And so it wasn't God's plan ever to set up a monarchy, but the people wanted it. They wanted to set up a monarchy to be like the other nations. Whereas God said, hey, no, I'm your king. You don't need a human king. You get a human king, he's going to tax you to death. He's going to conscript your boys. Uh, he's going to oppress you. And, uh, and they said, oh, we want, a, we want a king like everyone else has got a king. You know, we want a king, we want a king. And, and at the end, Samuel was so angry. And God said, don't be angry. He goes, they're rejecting me, not, not, not you. So give them a king. And so Samuel finds uh, from the family of Kish a young man named Saul. He was huge, tall, handsome, beautiful to look at. And outwardly, he seemed so good. He seemed like a good character. But he was man's choice. And uh, so he, he, he reigned for 40 years, but he was a disaster as a king. And, uh, and in halfway through or so, his monarchy, God said, I've had it. Goes, uh, his, his family cannot continue ruling. I want to select another person. And so that's where now Samuel has, goes to Saul and says, Saul, because of your sins, and Saul's sins are terrible, uh, he failed as a king. And you can read that in 1, 1 Samuel 13, 14, 15. Goes, I'm, I'm going to select somebody else. And so now the selection process is starting, and God directs Samuel to go to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. And so... Uh, he goes there and he, he has this hunch in God that one of Jesse's sons is going to be the king, the new king. But this has all got to be done in secret because if Saul finds out, he'll exterminate the house of Jesse and anyone that's a pretender to the throne. So, and Samuel could have been killed as well. So Saul became a maniac, became a dictator, he became an absolute monarch and, and God wanted them to be constitutional monarchs under the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And, and God was to, to rule, so the king was not absolute monarch like the other kings, they, they had to obey the laws. And because Samuel, Saul didn't, uh, he lost the mandate of heaven. So anyway, so, so Jesse calls his boys to be paraded and of course the oldest comes out first because, you know, he thinks this is the one. And even Samuel thinks that. So let's read what happens. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here bef before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. And this is interesting. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. See, Saul, the first king, he looked terrific in the Israelites' eyes, but his height and his good looks couldn't hide the smallness of his heart. God was now wanting a man with a big heart of character, as well as having the necessary competencies to be able to, to be a, a skillful ruler. So Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel scratches his head and says, I don't feel anything. And yet I think it's got to be one of your sons. Uh, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, um, are these all the sons you have? And, and tell me if I'm reading too much into this. It's like, I think Jesse's going, well, yeah, they're, 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 they're the ones. Like, he's like, David's out of mind, out of sight. And he goes, they're still the youngest. You know, Jesse answered, but, but he's tending the sheep. He's up in the hills and far away, and, and he probably stinks like the sheep, and you wouldn't want to, you know, you wouldn't want to see him and meet him. He's an he's a unusual boy. <laughs> Jesse forgot about his youngest boy because he didn't bring him with the seven, either deliberately or just subconsciously. He's kind of he's disrespecting him. He was overlooked by his dad, and I think it reveals a lot about his attitude towards this unappreciated boy growing up. And you think of a boy growing up not being appreciated by dad or, or his brothers. So Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Wow. And he anoints him with a ram's horn. King Saul was anointed with a beautiful vial. A vial made by human hands. The ram's horn was made by God. It required the shedding of blood, the sacrifice of that animal so that horn could be taken. It's kind of a type, an illustration to us that the anointing that Saul received was man's anointing. Whereas the anointing that David received was because he was called by God 
and God was going to use him in a unique way. And so you, you see here with, with Jesse, um, his attitude towards his son. And, well, the older brothers, the seven of them, again, we only have one text, but it's enough to say this kid is being belittled by the older brothers and he's, be, he's basically being bullied and they can't stand him. His very presence arouses something within them. They just detest him. Where do they get that attitude from? How do you get to that point where you detest this little boy? What's he done wrong? He's unusual. He's different. But somehow they're cursing this kid. And I think it came through the father. And you get this with Eliab's response. When, when Jesse asks young David, he says, David, the boys are being conscripted by King Saul. They're fighting the Philistines. There's this giant called Goliath who's running amok, could you please take some food and provisions for your brother? So David goes, and as he goes, and, and, he, and he watches, and he, and he sees what's taking place. He's all eyes, he's all goggle eyed and, and he sees this Goliath defying the armies of Israel and threatening and menacing, and the, and the, and the Hebrews running back because of his noise and, uh, and his threats. And so this is, Eliab sees David, and this is what he says. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him. Why have you come down here? Like instant rage at the very presence of this boy. He arrives, rage. So I think that kind of rage and oppression and bullying was there all the way through this kid growing up by the older brothers. And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? Like your little sheep. You know, who did you leave them with? You know, you're being responsible. I know how conceited you are. Like he's making, I mean, it's a terrible statement. And how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. And look at David. This is an, a, the, the cry of a hurt, abused young boy. Now what have I done? What have I done now? I'm just bringing you water and food. Like, it's almost like every time you talk to me, you, you put me down. There's not a, you can't think of anything positive. Now what have I done? I'm here to help you, and you're cursing me again. Can I even speak now? Are you so oppressing me that I can't even open my mouth and speak? Man, that's bad, isn't it? It's not, it's not good. Um, so from this, and then you look at David's life, to look at his life, and without God, you think, man, where could have this guy gone? David developed into what I call a full-on personality with incredible intensity, a man of extremes. I know of nobody in the Old Testament. Maybe Elijah is another one, but Elijah, he just has a complete nervous breakdown through it. And then he comes out of it as, as a different man. So Elijah... Sort of, he's got this intensity as well, but then he breaks down. And then the, the, the second half of Elijah's story, he's a team person, he develops people, and he's a lot more placid. David, he is intense right through to the end. And, and also uh, capable of great extremes. Um, for example, he had an unusual desire in him to fight and kill. Um, he was a fighter. And he, and he actually did a lot of killing. And it seems like he enjoyed it. That's the part that's a bit shocking. He was so full on that when he was a soldier, he was a soldier and he did it to the best of his ability. Um, so have a look at this. This is the scene now where David talks to Saul because he's seeing this, this uncircumcised Philistine defying the armies of Israel. He's only a kid. He's a teenager. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep because I've been looking after the sheep. Because when a lion, I mean, listen to this. When a lion or a bear come and carry off a sheep from the flock, I chase it. I go after it and I strike it and I rescue the sheep. You can't have that sheep, you rotten bear. You lion, give me that sheep back. And when it turns on me, I seize it by the hair and I kill it. Hey, how do you grab a lion by the hair and kill it when you're a teenager? That is weird behavior. You know, like, um, and he goes, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. Like, this is, this is practice for me. 
This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Now look, I asked this question, you know, if it was me, I'd let the lion have the sheep. Hey, I've got 30 of them. One, let him have a little bit of mutton for tea. I mean, like, let, why chase after it? I mean, you know, they, they do give birth, you know, and there'll be other sheep that come along. Um, why take such a risk? Why take such a risk? You see, a normal human being would have passed on this, but not David. And so he, he not only takes the sheep back, but he wants to wreak vengeance on that lion and the bear because I killed him. He says the king, the king would have looked at him and said, you're a scrawny little guy, you can't even fit in my armour. You kill a lion and he goes, and then he says, as for that giant, I'm going to have him for breakfast. And when you see Michelangelo's David in, in Florence, and uh, I've got some fantastic pictures of it, censored ones now, that I sent a few years ago. I mean, I think Michelangelo captured, the, when you look at David's face, and he's, he's like this, and he's got the, the rocks in the hand, and he's got the sling over it. It's like he's looking at him saying, mate, you're going down. It's like there's this anger. Now, he's saying he's doing it for God, and I have no doubts that he, that he was doing it to serve God because he couldn't stand what this guy was saying. But it was like... I want to get you. And, and the thing is, he's never killed a man before. And by, within a couple of hours, he's lifting the guy's head. What is that? Most kids are squirm, squirmish about that. So he says, make my day. And so Goliath is coming towards him. You know what David does? He starts running towards him. Like he says, I'm going to, I'm going to take your head off today. And he did that. So what is that in him? There's, there's, a, there's an intensity, there's this desire, there's this extreme in him that I see is, is quite unnatural. It's not normal. It's excellent for somebody who's going to be a military commander who's going to sp take no prisoners. And that was David. Um, and one of his crashes, when he burns, when, when he crashes and burns... Uh, I'll talk about one of them the, the, the situation with Bathsheba and Uriah was a horrendous, it wasn't just adultery it was murder and it was just such a horrific sin that uh, there's chapters devoted to it and he, he repented of it uh, but the damage he caused to his family was irreparable uh, the kids had seen all this behaviour even though he was restored and then another time he falls away and he becomes a mercenary See, if King Saul's out to get him and so on one occasion, King Saul had hired 3,000 policemen, Gestapo, and said, I want you to hunt for him. And so David is running for his life. He's being hunted. And he ends up in this cave of Adullam. And this is why when you read the Psalms and it says he wrote this when he's in the cave, you, you read the context. I mean, he's at the end of his tether. The police are out to get him. They're going to kill him on sight. So that's where he pours out his heart about, God, I, I, I don't know what's going on. And, and then he, he, David's always praying, he's always seeking for guidance, but on this one occasion, he doesn't pray, he doesn't seek guidance, he actually joins the Philistines as a mercenary, he and his 600 boys. And uh, so he becomes a mercenary. And it says, it's hard to, to read, when he was on raiding parties, he would kill everyone, men and women. It doesn't say children, he wouldn't spare them. What is that? And he's anointed to be king, He's away from God, and what he does as a mercenary, he does it with all of his heart, and he doesn't spare anyone. And even his men were about to turn on him, because one time he's out on a raiding party, and, and so the, the families all get kidnapped. And he, they're so down that the men pick up stones, and they're going to stone their leader, their future king. And that's where we see that David calls out to God again and gives his heart back, and gets restored, and, and then this is all before he became the king. So he's, he's, a, he's, an, extreme, he's an extreme man. And uh, I only say this to you because sometimes people read this and don't draw any, don't see any truth here that our family of origins, okay, and the things that have happened to us will affect us. 
Even though we've become Christians, unless we become acutely aware, self-aware enough to say, you know what, I need help. I need Jesus. I need some counselling. I need a good book like The Me I Can Be or Dr. Henry Cloud's Changes That Heal. I, I need support. I need some therapy. I need to face up to why do I keep doing these things? And so uh, even Christians are capable of, of giving into the dark side if they don't, don't face these things. And David did on a couple of occasions. Now, let me also now get on the positive, is that not only did he have an unusual desire in him to fight and kill because of his intense personality, full-on personality, but he also had a single-hearted devotion to God. So when he was full-on for God, I mean, there's no one like him. I mean, he's a totally full-on for God. There's nobody in the Old Testament that can write like David writes about his relationship with God. It's almost like he so needs God in his life that, that at those times, if God doesn't come through for him, he's dead, he's finished. And uh, let me read to you one of my favorite Psalms. This is David saying, the Lord is my light. I've had my kids and grandkids memorize this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Because he had so many fears. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Then he goes, I love this. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Isn't that beautiful? And one day he's in his palace and he's thinking, he's always thinking about God. He's got this beautiful cedar palace now in Jerusalem. He's conquered the Jebusite city and Jerusalem's now his capital. And he's looking down and goes, I've got this and God lives in a tent. I want God to have a palace like I have. So he comes up with this idea and he says to Nathan the prophet, I've got an idea. Nathan probably goes, not another one, you know. Like, and so Nathan, he shares with Nathan about building this fantastic temple for God. And Nathan goes, good idea. And Nathan goes and prays, and Nathan comes back and says, well, yeah, you can plan it, you can pay for it, but you ain't going to build it. God says, David, you've shed too much blood. I think I want a man of peace to build my, my temple. And that was Solomon, his son, who didn't do a lot of killing and, and all that. And so... Um, so here he, he's, he's like, one thing I ask from the Lord, this I say that I may dwell in this house forever. Now, here's some lessons, some practical lessons. Firstly, parents, then, then to all of us. If you're a parent or a grandparent, listen to me today. Appreciate each of your children and grandchildren equally. Grandparents, you may see your son or your daughter favoring one of the kids. It happens in life. Don't tell them. Don't tell them off. This is life. You just make the difference with that grandchild. May that grandchild grow up knowing that there's been pure love, acceptance by you as a grandparent. Sometimes this happens where a mum just is drawn to one child or a dad is drawn to another child, their personality. Their, and one child can be very difficult. It is so important for parents to appreciate each of your kids equally. It's a big mistake if you don't do this or if you play favourites. And grandparents, you can make a difference here. I whisper in my grandkids' ears and I say, you know, Amari, you're my favourite. She goes, no, I'm not. I say, yes, you are, you're my favourite. And then um, she goes and speaks to Karis, Steph's child, and says, Papa says I'm his favourite. No, 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 he says I'm his favourite. <laughs> hey, I better go and see Christopher and, and Mia and, and the others. And they all know they're my favourites. The negative of that is they don't believe anything you tell them from now on. They think, Papa, we don't... We don't. <laughs> but what I'm wanting to do is for them to know that I've accepted them and loved them for who they are and I'm not comparing them with anyone else. They're my favourites. Appreciate each of your kids equally. Parents, cultivate mutual respect among your children. Jesse failed in this with his boys. And perhaps the other boys picked up their dad's attitude towards him. This is why it's so important that uh, you teach your children how to respect each other. 
and, and how to deal with areas of bitterness or disagreement and, and, and arguments. And kids argue, they fight, but just to make sure, let it be good, clean fighting without resentment and anger and bitterness and, and stuff like that. And teach them how to, those wonderful nine words, you know, I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. Build that into them so that they don't have attitudes towards one another. So important. So parents and grandparents, help introduce your kids to Jesus. I love Kay. I mean, she bought how many? About 15 grandkids the other Sunday. <laughs> how many you got? 22 or something? <laughs> and she said, oh, Pastor Bill, there are all these beautiful little kids and she's bringing them to church to introduce them to Jesus. Grandparents, introduce your kids to Jesus. Parents, help introduce your kids to Jesus. By your lifestyle and by your words, pray with them. Read the Bible with them. Memorize key Bible verses with them. Encourage them to attend church weekly and to get involved in some area of service. Get the kids to camp, young people. And if there's kids on the outer, pay for them to come to camp. Tell them and show them how you love them unconditionally. Tell them and show them. Demonstrate it to them. Model Jesus for them in all things. I remember a man many years ago, and um, he and his family are not in the church anymore, but I was watching his little boy, and, and I just thought, this kid is in real need. I could just see him. Just the, the facial features, the body language, and, and I just got this feeling like this kid has not been affirmed by his dad. And, and I, I just said to the dad, I took him aside, I said, can I just say something to you? I said, don't ask me questions. I said, I just, I just feel like your boy needs you to at least once a week take him, look into his eyes and tell him you love him and give him a hug and a kiss. And I found out he had not done that for years. And it twisted that little kid. It just, you could see him changing because he's crying out for the, for the, for the affection of, of a dad. And he wasn't getting it and it was screwing him up on the inside and it just shocked me when, when the dad said no I, I don't do that ah oh, man tell them and show them you love them unconditionally affirm their particular aptitudes and abilities each child has a God given aptitude a God given ability identify them and encourage them that they've been blessed by Jesus with this skill everyone's got an ability he's got to find it and give them the opportunity to develop their God-given gifts to the max. Invest in them. Put big bucks into it. Grandparents, help your kids. Pay for music lessons and do stuff. Invest into your, your, your grandkids. And if they've got a particular aptitude, a sport or a musical instrument or another ability, inspire them that they have something unique to offer Jesus, his church and our world. And pray constantly for them and see them through God's eyes. They're special gifts that have been loaned to us. And we never stop parenting. It just changes as you get older. You can never stop giving. You can never stop loving. You can never stop caring. And so you never stop parenting. And if you don't have your own children, find kids in the life of the church or in your community and parent them, love them, give to them. You don't know what difference it will make. And the, the story of David speaks to me of the importance of this. Now, for, for all of us, all of us, people look superficially. We all look superficially. Whereas God, he really sees us. He really does see us. And he sees you. It doesn't matter what your mum has said to you, what your dad has said to you, what the teachers have said to you, what your neighbours have said to you, what your siblings have said to you, or what they've done to you. And if you have voices that have been programmed in kind of repeating all that negative stuff, let me tell you this, from the authority of God's word, David went through this, and, and he knew that God really saw him and, and into his heart. And he writes this psalm. And I think this psalm flowed out of this. He said, you have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. Let God search you. Let him, 
You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. It's like David is saying, you know what? People don't really know me, but God really knows me. And, and the more intimately connected you become with Jesus, the more self-aware you'll become. And you'll, become, you'll get into a better position to receive the healing and the restoration from your family of origin issues. I don't know the answer. It's not just getting a psychologist. They may be helpful in identifying, but who actually can love you unconditionally and who can come into your life and change you from within by the power of his presence it's only Jesus through the Holy Spirit and I think David experienced that he experienced that powerfully secondly people easily forget but God will always remember us look at this I, I, I think David felt this one this this statement has comforted hundreds of millions of people and has brought healing to them though my father and mother forsake me this is my favorite psalm the Lord will receive me. Don't you feel that? I think David experienced that. You may have experienced that. Rejection is the worst pain. You may have been rejected by a husband. You may have been rejected by a wife. You may have been rejected by a friend. I know of no greater pain than rejection. It kills the heart. It's like cruel when, when as the Queen said in one of her speeches, she says, the more you love, the more you can get hurt. It's true. The people that you love the most have the power to hurt you the most. And some of you have been deeply hurt and rejected and forsaken. Now look at this. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. He will receive you and heal you. And finally, people often run ahead of themselves, whereas God is patiently ordering our circumstances. Hey, David illustrates this so powerfully. In spite of his mistakes and failures and sins, God is, is, is working in his life and working on his life and working through his life. And I can tell you, God is in control of your life. You may not see it. But you've got to put yourself in a position where you let him, let him in. Let him guide the process. I love this, this scripture, which I've uh, memorized. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Another translation says, I cannot help but believe that I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living today. Not tomorrow, today I'm going to see, I'm experiencing his goodness. God is good. Wait for the Lord. Be patient. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Because he is the one that orders our circumstances. Jesus is in control of our lives. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. Though all things are not good, he will work things out if you love him and pour out your heart to him and draw him in to the totality of your life. This is the answer to, to understanding origins. And David, without having God in his life, he would, have been, he would have just totally failed, been a disaster. But he became an amazing person, a pivotal man in history in spite of his mistakes and his failures. Can we stand together as we lead you in prayer and we sing a song? Thank you, Jesus. As we stand in the Lord's presence... I want to lead you in a prayer because some of you need to start a journey of healing. You may need to get hold of something like this to me, I can be, and start working through it. One of the men in the church said to me, Pastor Bill, I've read through every verse. Every verse? There's hundreds of them. Yep. And I'm doing it a second time. I need to re-script my brain. Wow, wow that's, that's fantastic. You may need to order God Changes at Hill by Dr. Henry Cloud. We, there's no copies in Australia. In fact, there's some, uh, Pastor Jill was telling me there's some YouTube clips of Dr. Henry Cloud. Anything that Dr. Cloud says, he's a top psychologist and top Christian theologian, brilliant. 
and uh, I'd get that book, changes it. I'll quote it, I'll use it in, in my book. You need to start a process of healing, restoration, self-awareness, calling out to him. Only then can those changes come and he gradually changes us. You need Jesus in your life. We all do. We need him to be at the very center, surrender to him. Let him do the changing. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for all of your people who are standing here. And as we've talked about David and read some magnificent Psalms and read some passages that are just shake us and shock us about the frailty of man and the weaknesses of our flesh and our sinful nature and how if we give into it that demons can take advantage and, and create terrible evil even though our heart is to want to do what's right but Lord protect us, help us as Jesus prayed that we should pray the, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one we need your leading, Lord. We need to be led by you to identify when the enemy exploits our natural weaknesses and family of origin issues and that stuff. Lord, I pray, save your people, heal your people, deliver your people, set them free to enjoy the fullness of life. Help them not to be tripped up by the things that have happened to them, no fault of their own. I pray that they'll become self-aware enough to lean into you to trust you that even in their state of weakness, they can be made strong through Jesus Christ. As Paul would say, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And even Jesus himself had to surrender to you, loving Father, at Gethsemane and fight his own desires and, and, and ultimately surrender to your, to your ultimate will and purpose. Lord, help us to stay surrendered, open to receive the healing that we need, and for many to start this journey, I pray help them to come to Christ again and again and again. As Saviour, Lord, Master, Deliverer, the one who can set us free. I thank you in your name. Amen.